What are the steps to really forgiving someone? And what can we do to start walking down that path? That's what we'll talk about today. You can't forgive without loving. And I don't mean sentimentality. I don't mean mush. I mean having enough courage to stand up and say, I forgive. I'm finished with it. My Angelo. Today we're going to continue the book by R.T. Kendall, Total Forgiveness. When everything in you wants to hold a grudge, point a finger, and remember the pain, God wants you to lay it all aside. I mentioned last time that I thought this book was key to this time and place. We just don't have a lot of forgiveness for anything in the world. And yet, it is time that we start honestly forgiving people. Because God forgives us. And don't we want to emulate God? And don't we want to give other people the forgiveness that we're given too? He starts out the second part of the book talking about Joseph and how Joseph, when he faced his brothers, didn't show bitterness or anger or vengeance or any of those things. It's interesting. I always love this story because he came to his brothers with compassion. He wanted to know some things for sure, and he didn't reveal himself at first, but he wasn't talking to them to make them suffer. He wasn't writing them a list of the things that they did to him. Instead, what he did is he faced them for the first time with questions, with conversation, two-way conversation, and we don't know where Joseph was all those years. Did he always express that lack of anger and bitterness? But he spent all those years in slavery and all those things that happened to him. And he could have been mad. He maybe was mad the first five years, and we don't know. But right now, we're at the end of the story, and all we know is that God helped him to come to a place where he could forgive them and hug them with tears in his eyes. He was filled with love. And so the question is, can we get that same way with other people? Joseph, the very first thing he did was he had everyone leave the room. He didn't want to start talking to his brothers and telling other people what they had done to him. So he didn't want to sit there and shame them. He didn't want to blast them into eternity. He wanted forgiveness and reconciliation. He wanted to know if his father was still alive. And so, again, he came to that without intimidation, without fear, and they were intimidated. But because they knew what people do when they're that mad, when that kind of thing is done to them, they know probably what they deserved. But we also know that instead, Joseph had this attitude. And like I said, I don't know, in the 22 years when he got that attitude, but he said in Genesis 45, 5, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. All those terrible things that got him in prison, worked his way up through, you know, being Pharaoh's secondhand person was there. So then now at this time of famine, which is why they went to Egypt, because Egypt planned because of Joseph's vision for this famine, for this time when food was not going to be easy to grow. And they came to get food. A lot of people came to get food. There were a lot of people living in Egypt because they needed to get food during this time of famine. And he says that God sent him there to save lives because of this. That is a really big, wide-open view of what's going on. Joseph had that big picture. Again, I don't know if he had it his whole life. And he allowed them to save face. He didn't embarrass them. He didn't punish them. And then he told them of his forgiveness. And the reunion was amazing. So again, Joseph didn't know if he was going to see his brothers again. When that time came, he knew what to do. And he could have put his hand down and had them thrown in prison. He could have done anything at that moment, but instead he forgave them. And so we have to make sure that when we forgive other people, 
that we're doing that just like our sins are forgiven, we're forgiving other people and keeping that Lord's prayer in mind. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And if you think about the kind of forgiveness you want to get, make sure you offer that to other people. That's what Joseph did to his brothers. He goes on to say in the Lord's Prayer that we need forgiveness the same way we need daily bread. We don't think of it like that. We think of forgiveness as being, you know, kind of a something happened and now I forgive. But instead, these are all things that we need every day. And he says that we may be asking ourselves, do we really have to forgive wicked people, horrible people? And the answer is yes, that we have to do it. And that it's a privilege from God to be able to be godly and forgive other people. So we shouldn't look at it as a burden, but as an opportunity that God has given us to be like God in forgiving other people. And when we don't forgive people, it shows that we're indifferent to the best thing that God did, which is to forgive us. He says that we interrupt the plan for this world of reconciliation and everyone coming back to God. Think about the apostles and had the people who put Jesus to death come to the worship at Pentecost. And immediately, Peter starts calling them out. And the mob maybe even beats them up and kills them. That's not what God wanted. He wanted reconciliation. God wants us to be grateful and show other people gratitude. He says, quote, Judging people is elbowing on God's exclusive territory. So we even think that if we want to judge, punish, seek vengeance, it's almost the same crime that Adam and Eve did. They wanted to be like God. And we're telling ourselves, I know God is the owner of this, and I'm going to punish him instead. And you're almost doing the same exact thing in taking over that position. It's, it's a very prideful thing. I always wondered in my little brain if pride in the end is the only sin that exists because we think we can do something better than what God does. And if we think we can take vengeance, we're thinking we can do better than God. We're being self-righteous. We're being prideful. Maybe we're being afraid. But even in my church, we don't sue people. We're not supposed to sue other people unless somehow we are protecting other people from harm. But we're not doing something that the situation's over with and we want to get compensated for it. We're not suing anybody. And I think that's why in those passages, instead, we are to work towards forgiveness instead of lawsuits. Boy, you want to talk about an unpopular Christian view in the world. We always have the big ones out there that everyone knows of. But not suing someone when you could? Ooh, there is a big countercultural movement right there. We should pray for them. We should ask that they're blessed and that they prosper because we know God is praying for us and acting towards us to prosper as well. So he says that, quote, when you totally forgive your enemy, you have crossed over into the supernatural realm. I think that's amazing. That's such an amazing statement because we want to not persecute our enemies which the Greek word persecute means to follow or pursue. We're not hunting him down. He says he's like King Saul running after David. But instead, forgiveness is not persecution. We are just not going after them. And even if they are guilty of something really horrible, remember, we can do pretty horrible things in the eyes of God too. So again, make sure that when you forgive people, you realize how important it is that you do so, not just because of your relationship to God and not just because of that relationship you have with that other person, but it's because that is the way God intended this world to be. So he says how you forgive people is, first of all, you have to make an intentional choice to forgive, but you're also going to make an intentional choice not to tell anyone about it. As soon as you smear someone, that isn't in the nature of forgiveness. You know, that's an anti-forgiveness kind of thing. So you're going to keep what happened to you personal. Talk to Jesus about it. The second thing is, he says that we're going to be 
pleasant around them. We're not going to be angry. We're not going to give them the side eye. We're not going to do anything that's going to make them anxious or worried or upset about retribution. And he says in the end, when we do these types of actions, no one's going to know what we did. We're not gaining glory for it. And then we're not going to humble brag. You know, I could have just completely reamed out that guy and instead I forgave him. He says it could break your heart. But then when you pray, God will truly bless you. He says that when we pray for our enemies, that we could be doing it solely out of duty. We could be doing it because we understand that we owe a debt to God, and so we should do it. Maybe we desire to pray for your enemy. That's a better place to go, isn't it? That you want to pray for your enemy or the person who harmed you. He says you could take delight in the fact that you pray for your enemies. And then he says there's a durability, which means we're taking that lifelong, I am never going to go back on this feeling. No matter how many times this person harms me, how many many times my dad drinks and makes my day miserable, the forgiveness is built in. That's durability. And that is the ultimate level of forgiveness. It's the level of forgiveness God gives to us. If we do these things, we might be surprised and find out that our enemy has now become our friend. But I think more than that, when we think about God's world, and I was thinking about this when it comes to Pentecost, Peter sitting there and watching the very people who put Jesus to death, standing there listening to the message of God, had to really tick you off. And even when Paul tried to come to them when he was blinded and then brought to the apostles, I'm sure there was no way they wanted to forgive him. There's no way without that Jesus built into them, giving them strength, you know, giving them the right words, hauling them back to understand how they're forgiven. They never would have forgiven Paul in a million years for the things he did. Some people felt that Paul was there at the stoning of Andrew. And so, again, it makes me think, too, of Corey Ten Boom. She was born in 1901, and she died in 2000. And she lived in the Netherlands. But to watch her help people, see that she was able to give forgiveness to the people who came into power in her land, did all the things that they did to Jewish people at that point, and her sister died in a concentration camp in Germany. When her sister became frail, she said to her, No, don't hate Corey. You must love and forgive. And she says in her own words that she knew she wasn't able to forgive. She said, quote, The Lord reminded her of a scripture. God's love had been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Romans 5, 5. But she said then she knew that she was unable to do this, but the Lord in her was able to give that forgiveness. She writes, quote, At that moment, When I was able to forgive, my hatred disappeared. What a liberation. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It is a power that breaks the chain of bitterness, the shackles of selfishness. What a liberation when you can forgive. And think of that imagery. She used concentration camp imagery there. But instead of being put into prison by people. She was saying that forgiveness broke the locks on the door, the handcuffs, the chains, and the shackles. So, and for someone like Corey Ten Boom, who saved about 800 Jewish people from a concentration camp and then went to the concentration camp herself because she ended up helping Jewish families And afterwards, she went out and helped people some more and spent her whole life dedicated to helping people and writing her amazing story down. When we think of Joseph, who had no reason in the world to forgive his brothers, he could have brought his father back and fed his brothers and let his brothers rot in prison. I mean, there's a lot of ways that Joseph could have done this, but instead he forgave. Corey forgave. Martin Luther King Jr. had a lot of reasons to be angry hateful, wanting vengeance, could have easily called any of those things just. 
because of what people had done to him, done to his people, and instead, he talked about forgiveness. So my challenge to you is think if you can take that next step of forgiveness and not just forgive someone, but instead pray for them, that they may prosper and that they may find the Lord. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that if you could subscribe and tell a friend about this podcast, I'd sure appreciate it. And remember, our step towards wanting our enemies to prosper starts with small steps. Because goodness, we could never take such a big step without God. (laughs) 